it's really great to be here and um, I, I'm very grateful to um, Origins and the Botany Bay um, group for inviting me. So I will introduce you in the Dakota way that I've been taught. So Imachiape in Washichu, Stephanie Pratt, Imachiape Dakota, Iokpiwi. And that means my name in the European language is Stephanie Pratt. My name in Dakota is Happy Woman, Iokpiwi. Midawakantawaka i Hankdawana Hemacha. Chante Washte Chiujapi. I come from band one and six of the Ocheti Shakui, and I thank you and give you all greetings with my heart. First of all, I'd like to say that I speak as an art historian and historian of colonial entanglements in North America. I speak only for myself and that I've been taught by elders of my own communities. And so I speak with that knowledge that comes from my Dakota ancestry. Now, I think when we, we look at plants today and we don't always see plants as food, but if you went into a supermarket and you went through the aisles and you couldn't find corn or potatoes or other plants from, uh, say, um, sweet potatoes, from what the Europeans thought was the new world. But we know today this wasn't a new world. It was a very old world. Many, many thousands, so far back beyond memory, the indigenous peoples of the Americas had been cultivating plants. And one of the main plants they cultivated was maize, or we call it sweet corn or corn. Um, Zia maize had been for thousands of years cultivated. So this is one of the plants that I want to talk about when we talk about the histories and their tr the travels of North American, South American, Mesoamerican plants. And, and maize was one that was grown all over the Americas. So if we turn maybe to um, look at some of the pictures I've brought, there is one of just maize itself, sweet corn, but also um, I have pictures of a detail of a map from Samuel Champlain, who was a French explorer. And here in the, on the map, you have a detail. You can see the homes of indigenous people. This is 1605, so it's in the early colony, colonial period that we see maize fields growing beside the homes of indigenous people. So this was something very common that people would see. And so when the explorers, the colonials, colonial settlers came, they took it, well, they took advantage of this knowledge and they took they took some species of the plant back home to Europe. And this is where um, we get our staple, staple food, corn. And it's fed to people and to animals. So all, you know, millions and millions and millions of people and animals are fed with corn. So that's one of the travels. Um, and then um, we can also look at the way that corn has been pictured by artists, both indigenous artists and later how we think about corn. This is a Mayan maize god. It was a sculpture found at Copan, which is in Honduras, and they think was created in about 715 AD. And so when we look at this, we can see that corn was not only seen as a plant and, and a grow and a food and a, a sustenance, maize was given godlike status. It was given a figure of a young man 
a beautiful young man with youthful features, the ideal of Mayan beauty. And he personifies this whole relationship with Maze so that we see the indigenous creator of the image honoring Maze as this more than human being, more than superhuman being, um, a god. And in his, in that sort of beautiful hair that you can see on the sculpture, it's being really picked out by the sculptor. That emulates the way that Maze has its own hair. And if you have the chance to see an ear of corn in the shop and you can pull the leaves back, you can see this silky, beautiful white hair that's inside of that, protecting the, the seeds, the, the corn itself. So this is the way an indigenous artist created something about maize. I have a slide, which you can see on my PowerPoint, that talks about a indigenous North American tradition. It may spread to others, but mainly North American of the three sisters. And these were a group of three different plants, but they were personified as women. So I think when we look at this as women or as young men, this is sort of a metaphor. I don't know if you know that word means anything to you, but it, it means that it's not completely human and it's not completely plant. It's, they are beyond both of those things. They, so the three sisters were almost the first sisters, that they came and taught all the people how to plant. So these were beyond our realm supernatural beings that came and these were personified as sisters. So we have the three plants, which are maize, corn is one of them, the, the oldest, oldest sister. She's the tallest and she grows such a high height. If you've ever been near a cornfield, it goes way up high to the sky. <laughs> and so you can hide in a cornfield but also the, the leaves then spread out from the older sister and that provides shade and protection for the younger sisters who depend on her as both a support and a protection. So the middle sister, which is the legume or bean plant, grows up her older sister's stalk. So the bean, the legume, is the second sister, the middle sister, and then the youngest sister, the, the, almost the baby, grows on the ground. Like babies stay close to the earth and they crawl. And so this younger sister is the squash or pumpkin plant. And her leaves are sort of prickly and they also protect. And they keep the ground moist. And the middle sister, you think, has not done anything but her... Her great contribution is hidden. If you go down the bean plant all the way down into the earth, she, is, she has little microorganisms that live underneath in her roots that take nitrogen, that substance in the earth, and they bring it into the plant. So she is locking nitrogen, which is something we all need to grow, we need as human beings. So she is nitrogen giving. So she gives that to her sisters and to us. So these three sisters were honored. And this is the way indigenous, or at least the teachings that I have received, that you honor those who help you and that you know this is a reciprocal. And reciprocal means give and take. You can receive and you can give in a reciprocal relationship. And this is something that was taught to me, but also in a book by a, a great teacher, Robin Wall Kimmerer in Braiding Sweetgrass, her book. And this is where I 
I respect her and bow to her knowledge of plants in, in this instance. This is where we get into something I'm really interested in, which is the way that we can receive inspiration from plants. That we look outside our window. Right now I'm looking at a rose bush, which is absolutely the most beautiful um, old-fashioned rose of a really beautiful, sweet, deep pink color. So the indigenous women of, of my, my heritage, the Dakota Lakota and Lakota women, looked at plants, they looked at plant forms, and they looked at colors, and they received inspiration for their designs when they turned to make designs on clothing or regalia, beadwork, um, and before beadwork, what they call quill work, which is an older form of decorative practice that the women would do together. And, and this is something that is, I think, really missing, is the way that women work together in indigenous societies in Dakota Lakota culture. There were societies of women that came together and worked together to make something, either their own beading or um, the scraping of a hide because they often made clothing and other regalia out of buckskin or buffalo hide. So the women worked together and they told stories to each other and they shared. But I, I want to show you just a couple of examples of Dakota practice, beadwork and quill work, to show you the inspiration that women artists from these communities made. So these are very distinctly Dakota designs and the historians of those communities understood what these designs meant. And they are inspired from plants, from the way that plants grow, the way that leaves form in particular shapes, and the, the very distinctive pattern of Dakota is symmetrical. So if you have a leaf on one side, you have it on the other. If you have a flower or a bird on one side, you have it on the other side. So this um, wonderful vest, which is held in the Hood Museum in Dartmouth College, is, is a great piece because it has quill work as well. And I mention quill work because it's not the same as beading. I mean, what I'm saying is that it was a different technique where you collected the porcupine quills, the quills of the prickly porcupine. And you didn't do this when they were alive. I think you waited till an animal had died and then take what you can from that and flatten those. You flatten the porcupine quill and then you weave it and, and attach it to the surface of the buckskin or the cloth fabric. So this is a very unique and beautiful piece. There, there are others like this, but I was very much drawn to this, this vest. And then just to show you on the other side of the slide is the Dakota wall pocket. And these are an adaptation from contact with the outsiders you know, with the settlers and the, the colonial people who came, they used these little pockets that would attach to the wall and they'd put flowers and other things inside them. They were usually made of wood or something. But this is a Dakota adaptation where they have taken that idea and created a decorative piece to put on the wall. And if you think about it, if you have a dirt floor or if you have a floor you don't want to leave anything on, you can keep things in this wall pocket like scissors or spoons or any other implements. So they were very useful in those kind of early houses of the 19th century, wood houses, or perhaps uh, even within um, a teepee. I'm not sure that that's where this came from, but those are the two. And you can see, again, how symmetrical the design on the wall pocket is. So that, that's one example that I wanted to show you. It's interesting and one has to think that this is a, what happens with trade is that we, we engage with the other 
culture, the, the outsider person, and we give and take. They have the reciprocal nature again. And, um, and the invention that Native women in, in those Dakota communities with taking those beads, which were their own designs, nobody copied them. It was, they often received some of their information about the designs from dreams and, and other inspiration, like I say, plant forms. And so um, this is a real kind of, it's its own evolution of design and it's, it's just fabulous. And a, another example I have is a Dakota tablecloth which um, is on the on the PowerPoint. And this is just a superly beautiful and wonderful design, which is to me shows that engagement with, you know, first of all, a tablecloth is something, you know, you probably put over the table and tables were not used by indigenous culture traditionally, but here is an adaptation and yet sticking to very much that idea of the symmetry and the beauty of inspiration, looking at plants and flowers. There are birds on this tablecloth. And right in the center is, I think, a very interesting sun design, perhaps drawing attention to sunflowers. And sunflowers are also an indigenous North American plant, which has been taken and used and adapted over here in Europe and um, as far as Russia and Ukraine, the sunflower has become very important to those countries. I am so inspired by the younger women and, and older women, but particularly two younger women artists that I've, I've been in contact with and I wanna thank them both for agreeing to allow me to use some of their beautiful work in this talk. So the first one I want to talk about is a Dakota from Spirit Lake. And Marlena is um, a self-taught Native American woman artist, but she, what she is known for particularly is creating digital work. And again, this is just so inventive. I have one of her very famous pieces called Become the Seeds of Change. And she created this so inspired by that concept of a seed that you don't know what it will be when you maybe you've, you haven't identified it. You put it in the ground and then what comes out is, a, is kind of a surprise. And it comes from the quote, become the seeds of change. And it's based on... Um, an indigenous expression, they tried to bury us, they didn't know we were seeds. So there's an aspect of which Marlena is reclaiming her heritage, reclaiming her preeminence of her scientific knowledge, her knowledge of plants, and from a Dakota perspective. So you see in her dis digital design that she's got sunflowers and they're, they're sunflowers like you've never seen before. And I think digital art, she's, she's exploring all of the possibilities that digital art can, with your imagination, you can create. Uh, and another thing that she's been doing is actually to reclaim spaces in the North American continent as indigenous. So <clears throat> in the center of Minneapolis and St. Paul, where she, she lives near there, she goes and overlays landscapes with a digital projection so that you imagine yourself back into the indigenous space and what the world was like when they held that land, when before the settler colonial people came. So it's just um, a fabulous practice and we're very indebted to her. So. That's Marlena. And then um, another artist that I really want to draw attention to is the work of Jordan Ann Craig. And she is from the Plains. She's a Cheyenne artist, and she's a painter, printmaker, and textile artist. And her work explores very deep concerns of existence, time, and space. 
So it's very transformative. When you see her work, you sort of almost are enveloped by it. It's so beautiful in the colors, so wonderfully harmonious. And she particularly draws inspiration from indigenous textiles and beadwork, pottery, and landscapes. So um, although when you see her paintings, they're, um, they show this very careful patterning. And that's something that I've seen in beadwork. Beadwork, when it's done to the fullest, is very, very careful. Each bead laid precisely. And Jordan's work is, is like that. And she's talked about how she makes her work and how careful she is about getting everything in line. So her painting, Red Orange Dyed Quills of 2019, looks back to those same women who work together in cooperation, making beautiful pieces, honoring their past and their ancestors, but also the future, future generations, giving that knowledge on to the next group of people. It's, it's so interesting when you go down to the level of DNA, which is this very, you know, important information code within our cells, how close we all are in creation. And this honoring, the indigenous people honor that, you know, that these are brothers and sisters very much to us. So the sunflower was again, yes, a staple and cultivated from, you know, from a wild plant into something that could feed, could be used in ceremonial, uh, could be used as an oil, um, so sunflowers have this multi-dimensional um, use, um, like many of the plants um, that we have even around us today in our own gardens. We have things like uh, we're growing marjoram in our garden or oregano. It's a flavoring for food. It's wonderful with tomatoes. So if you, you might even have some wild marjoram in your garden. If you see a little green plant, I wish I had a picture of little pink flowers and the bees really come around it. That might be marjoram. So these plants, um, like the sunflower, have all these roles and purposes. And um, the sunflower particularly has been almost um, industrialized. Well, it has been industrialized over here so that it feeds, again, it feeds animals, it feeds humans, it creates oil. And, and we've even had problems in supply now where the oil is not available anymore. So this shows our dependence on these very, very crucial staple foods like maize, like potatoes, like rice, and like the sunflower. We, we need them and they need us, so we need to protect them if they're under threat. I, I can't really speak about plants in ceremony, how they've been used, but I have been taught about sweet grass and sage and cedar. Um, so some of my first understandings had come from the burning of dried cedar and dried sweetgrass. And that term, braiding sweetgrass, is the way that it is used because the person who's collected the plant will then braid it like, you know, a plait um, in your hair. And then it dries a little bit and you can then light, light it with fire and what they call smudge yourself. So it's called smudging and sage, white sage is used as well as cedar. So these are the plants that are gathered at certain times of year. And I was taught when we were gathering sage on the Cheyenne River Reservation, never to pull the plant straight out from the ground because all the roots will come and it will die. So you've lost that plant. So instead, when you're gathering and you're coming up to a plant and you're actually going to ask the plant, 
you know, or ask their forgiveness. I'm, I'm going to take some of you to use to help me. And normally you would give some tobacco to the plant. You would lay tobacco on the earth or, or burn tobacco and, and say a prayer and thank, thank the plant. So then you would collect it, but only, you know, a few on each of the different bushes. You wouldn't like take all one bush. And this kind of sense of balance and reciprocity, that, that connection and reciprocal nature that we have with plants and animals, this is something that was taught to me. My garden is, um, it's, it's big here in Devon. It's, it's got a wood, uh, a sort of a oak wood growing at the top. It's on a hill. And at the very bottom is a flatter place where we can cultivate. And we are going to try to grow vegetables again. It's, um, it's kind of up and down because the earth there is not very good. It's very rocky, it's got a lot of clay. So this reciprocal nature that I talk about, this relationship that we have is, you have to pay attention, you have to listen. Does this plant like where it's planted? And some plants don't want acidy soil, some don't want sand, or some do want. So my husband, who is the head gardener of our family, <laughs> Um, says, well, that plant doesn't look like it's doing too well. Let's move it over here in the sunshine, or let's take it out of the sun, or let's put this one on this rocky, like the saxifrage plant we bought. It's a tiny little flower. It's very, very pretty. We moved it to a sandier, sort of rough soil, not very much brown earth. It loved it there. So it's interesting that if you pay attention, you can learn from plants and they're telling you things like I'm really happy here or I don't feel so good please give me some food you know sometimes we have to put compost you know compost is the sort of degraded vegetable matter sometimes from our cooking like onion skins or banana skins and we throw them in and eventually they they sort of degrade down to a brown sort of um, I don't know, soft flakiness. I, it's hard to describe it if you haven't seen compost, but we use that too because it, that has a lot of rich nutrients, which the plants like. So these are basic things that, to be honest, I didn't know as a child. I wasn't taught by my family, but in life, I was given these things through my marriage, through living here in England, um, these possibilities to learn more about how to grow plants because I didn't do it as a child. And I lived in a suburb in near Sacramento in California. And it just, my mother grew plants, but you know, they were just bushes and I didn't really have to do very much. And I didn't, I engaged with nature and I would go out and sit in my garden and, and my back garden and I loved it, but I didn't grow things. So that's, I think there is something very special about when you have your own plant and you've, you've planted it and you've watered it and you've cared for it and it, and then it, it really thrives. So that, that's the relationship that I talk about. And it is a human thing. And maybe some of us have just not been taught it or just, you know, it's not been part of our experience, but it, you, you know, there's still time to learn. So that's my message. <laughs>